I'm Alexander Rose, I'm the executive director here at the Long Now Foundation, and thank you for all being here in real life. I'm particularly excited about tonight because really in some way, a lot of what Long Now does is, is speculative futures. The, clock, the 10,000 year clock in a way is a, is a speculative future. Um, in, in other ways, things like science fiction is a spec, speculative future. Shows like Black Mirror that take a piece of technology and push it forward and, and make us believe in that future for a moment is a speculative future. And it's a way of, of putting an intervention in the world that confronts us in, a, in some ways, physical or mental way that changes our perspective uh, in a much more real way than just, uh, you know, just, just a a virtual thing. One of the things that was given to me by a friend uh, is this one, this robot emotions kit for when your robot needs to have happiness. Uh, so this little chip and you know on the back of it it reads, this chip will make you feel happiness when encountering any of the following. Cats, root beer floats, fiddlers, Dutch colonial furniture, frisbee golf, seven layer burritos, and celebrity impersonators. Um, but this kind of a simple object like this that puts you into that future. Uh, really does a lot more than your average thing. And that's what Johanna is really trying to figure out is how to get you into that place where you're imagining futures that we need to imagine to make a better world. Welcome, Johanna. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for coming, everybody. I'm Johanna Hoffman. I'm an urbanist. I am a strategist. I'm a designer. And... I'm also the co-founder of a studio called Design for Adaptation. I'll be diving in this talk into the work that is behind my book, Speculative Futures, and it focuses on how speculative design and storytelling tactics can be used to address long-standing issues in urban development, and specifically, I explore the field of speculative futures, as the title of the book indicates, to really articulate how we can use these tools to co-create the resilient cities that this century really demands. This is a shot of Lake Oroville, which is a critical reservoir for the state of California. For me, it's a visual reminder of how 20th century systems are not up to the task of providing for 21st century life, because it's becoming clear that the upheaval of the last two years is really an indication of the intensities that are coming. Right? The technological changes, the ecological extinctions, the political upheavals, they are only likely to accelerate. All of which highlights the fact that we can't look to the past as a template for what's coming, creating more resilient development. Really demands that we look beyond the logic of what we know now and imagine what else can be. So given this pressing need for imagination, people in urban design and development could be leading the push for a proactive adaptation. But for the most part, we're not. This is a picture of the Harbin Opera House, which is designed by mad architects, and it's been lauded, and rightfully so, for being really innovative when it comes to structural engineering. It's pretty far out looking, right? Like all buildings, it started out as a figment of someone's imagination. They came up with a new approach, they modeled it, they prototyped, they tested, they figured out how to make it real. All projects start as speculative realities until they're built. Despite these imagination-focused skill sets, emphasis in the development fields is still often placed on perpetuating the status quo. So a lot of municipal planning departments are too underfunded, they're too understaffed to really be proactive in pushing for that kind of adaptive change because it's a lot easier for projects to get funding, to get permitted, when they resemble what's been done before. They're less risky. Given the mounting uncertainties of the times that we live in, that trend is becoming increasingly dangerous. For example, it's still a common practice to build in high-risk fire zones with minimal protections in place. This is a shot of Coffee Park up in Santa Rosa after it burned down in a fire in 2017. Systems for building new housing are still based on supporting population sizes and density levels that made sense decades ago, not today. And that's made our construction rates slow to the point that we're in the affordable housing crisis that we're in right now. Building in floodplains, still common practice. This is a shot of flooding in Western Germany from 2021. This is Manhattan in 2021 during Hurricane Ida. This is Kentucky this past summer. The mounting severity of these crises stem from the fact that we are in a larger crisis of limited imagination. We have limited imagination about what our cities are, about the conditions that they're facing, and about what we need them to be in coming decades. And that limited imagination 
is in part the result of a long-standing trend in urban development that sees the future largely as a place to be predicted and controlled. Even with the best research and foresight, cities are going to continue to morph in ways that we can't predict. Again, the past is not a sufficient template for where we're headed. We also have limited imagination about whose visions are valued in city making, and that trend perpetuates urban development's long-standing trends of exclusion for generations. The work of city making has really limited public participation in order to minimize opposition and accelerate built work. And a lot of communities have been dismissed, disenfranchised, and displaced as a result, setting the stage for a lot of the social and economic inequities that are plaguing cities today. So a lot of you might be familiar with the phenomenon of urban renewal that shaped so much of 20th century development in the U.S. and beyond. And it was a mode of cleaning up what at the time were often denser cities, making them more spacious. A lot of times greener. What urbanists thought at the time were going to be better places for people to live. A lot of these redevelopments focused in places with communities of color, the residents of which were rarely consulted and often displaced as a result. So this is a shot of a demolition zone in the Hill District of Pittsburgh in 1957, while it was going through one of these urban renewal processes. Here in San Francisco. The Fillmore neighborhood was a particular target of urban renewal. The movement enacted really devastating effects on the city's black community that are still being felt over half a century later. Around 20,000 people were displaced by these urban renewal projects, and many were resettled in substandard housing in environmentally polluted areas. So, like so many during the urban renewal craze, residents there uprooted and removed. And at urban renewal's height, for every four units of low-income housing that were destroyed. For every new one that was built, so we're just like having this decimation of affordable housing going on over a prolonged period of time, and more than two thirds of the displaced were Black or Hispanic people. So in the years since, that kind of development has been increasingly decried, which is great, but its effects, unfortunately, are still very much with us. So when we're thinking about presenting futures as predictable, which is oftentimes what happens when they are used in order to displace people, right? We convince people that what's being proposed is the right thing to do, even if it causes repercussions that are harmful. We have to use them as prime forums for persuasion by grounding them in today's logic. When we place borders around our collective imagination, it makes long-standing issues appear increasingly intractable, and dystopian futures much more inevitable by the day. Given how dark current conditions can feel at times, it's easy to understand why imagining alternatives can feel so difficult. This is a shot of the city we are in right now, San Francisco, fall of 2020. It was frightening. <laughs> So cold on the ground because the heat of the sun couldn't reach us. It was literally orange and red out day. I still feel traumatized, and it was hard to remember that Armageddon wasn't going to continue forever. But the truth is that it's not. The future is not a given, and if we don't want dystopia to be our inevitable trajectories, we have to think differently and more creatively about what can be. The things that we picture in our minds are what we're more primed to accept, to embrace. To enact, and if we want more resilient cities, we need to shake off the limits that we place on our own imaginations. Speculative futures are design approaches that essentially create high-resolution visions of potential realities. So they're all about collapsing that distance that's between tomorrow and right now, so that they can help us reflect on the ramifications of potential change to inform the decisions that we make. Today, so the idea is: the more high resolution your understanding of a potential future is, you can refine whether or not it's where you actually want to go. Once you decide on a future that you might prefer for yourself, you can then think through, backtrack to the present moment, so you can identify steps that might actually be able to take you there. So, a well-known version of one type science fiction prototyping is Star Trek. A lot of tools that we now use on the daily, I see it in some people's hands. Like tablet computers or devices that translate language as they're being spoken, were shown in early versions on this show. People were very inspired by a lot of these demonstrations of these, at the time, fictional tools, and in the decades afterwards, have made them into real life. It also showed a more racially progressive and gender equal future than what was going on at the time, and that's another powerful aspect of speculative futures approaches: that they can critique what's happening, that's often taken as a given in the present moment, and help us think. Through what alternatives might actually be. So world building is another kind of speculative futures approach. This is an image from the movie Minority Report, which is set around the timeframe of 2050-ish. 
And to build the world, the filmmakers had to research what 2050-ish could be like. It wasn't just about looking into the technologies that could happen. It was also about diving into what political systems may be like. What are the ecological contexts? What are the cultural norms? And the film was so successful at grounding what at the time were really fringe areas of research. Responsive targeted advertising or touchscreen tech, like that wasn't around when it came out in the early 2000s, that it led to hundreds of patents in the years since because we could really see how these things might impact daily life. These days, some speculative features are designed to be experiential in digital form. This example is from Bidibon First Light, which is a VR exploration of a climate change Toronto by the First Nation artist Lisa Jackson. So as you put on these VR goggles, you explore what Toronto could be. It's hotter, it's wetter. And you also hear the languages of different First Nation people, the Wendat, the Ojibwe, the Mohawk, as you're moving through this world. So you're connecting to different aspects of its past, its present, as you are also exploring its future. Another approach is design fiction. These are typically ways of creating prototypes of tools that occur in a given scenario. What Sanders showed us at the beginning is very much a design fiction. Another example that I love is called Ayapo Repository. And it's a 2016 effort by two artists, Ayota Molo Akusende and Salome Sega, And they made basically a museum and a resource library of objects that affirm the futures of black people. So they got together with some different community members. They brainstormed what some of these objects might be that can support black life in coming years. And then they made them into objects. So very much from like the Afrofuturism tradition of doing this work. Another speculative futures tactic is speculative design which is basically a form for using design to challenge assumptions about current conditions and convention. This particular project is Hyphen Lab's neurospeculative Afrofeminism salon, which re-envisions a black hair salon as a lab for neurocosmetology and cognitive enhancement. So again, challenging the idea of what a black hair salon can be and doing it in high resolution fashion. Some speculative futures use more simple tactics. This is a project by the artist Candy Chang. She did a series after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans in the mid-2000s, and she covered buildings that had been made vacant and abandoned after the storm occurred, and she covered them with these stickers asking people to add their ideas of what they wish those buildings were instead. And its simplicity gets to the heart of really what speculative futures are all about. They're a means of asking what if and why not. What else can exist here in place of what is right now? So the process of proactively engaging with the future in these personal, high-resolution, tactile ways is something that researchers find increases our resilience as individuals and as societies. The more we imagine what the future can be, the stronger our abilities to engage with longer time frames become. The more we do that, the more we look into longer time frames, the more frequently we end up challenging assumptions and current conventions. The more we challenge those assumptions, the more that our senses of autonomy and resilience start to expand, so doing this work can make us more resilient on individual levels. The more we imagine the future together, the more socially resilient we often become. Social resilience is essentially a different community's ability to adapt, cope, deal with different kinds of social and environmental hazards. And researchers are finding that just as important as ecological and infrastructural resilience is, social resilience is just as critical. This picture is an image of Chicago's 1995 heat wave, which killed hundreds of people across the city. And researchers have found in the decades since that communities that weathered the event more safely, where less people died, were those where people knew each other. They were socially resilient because they were socially connected. So while infrastructural resilience, for example, can take large amounts of time and money to achieve, Social resilience, our connections to each other, the institutions that hopefully support us, is a more immediate opportunity that still has very real impact. So researchers have found that stronger degrees of collaboration and reciprocity are an effective means of enhancing that aspect of social resilience. So collaboration is a way of deepening trust, and connection also lays the groundwork for self-determination, all of which can be very critical to enhancing resilience. So speculative futures tactics help us do this work, help us build these connections in a few different ways. One is by cultivating possibility through play. So one example of what this can look like is a project called the Republic of Columbus Bean. And it was an effort that was led by an artist named Jorge Manos Rubio while he was working in Columbus Bean, which is a neighborhood in West Amsterdam. So residents in the area come from a lot of different cultures, which has resulted in some conflict over the years. 
And after trying some more traditional measures to address these issues, local government asked different artists and designers to try some more experimental tactics. So Manos Rubio worked with residents in the area to come up with the idea of turning the local square into a micronation. So even though he was the one who came up with this initial concept, of creating a micronation, he used speculative futures tools to invite the wider community to inhabit it and explore what it meant to create this alternative reality in the moment. So they used speculative futures tactics to invite different members of the community into this process. They made their own money, passport stamps, design fictions. They created a national space agency. They visited the actual European space agency, but they also came back to Columbus Bean, to the micronation of Columbus Bean, and used Tyvek kites to test out what their own future rocket launches could be. They created their own Olympic sports teams. So as the months progressed, the square became a sanctioned micronation, acknowledged in Amsterdam, but also by other micronations worldwide. It was a place where residents could start to imagine that they were citizens of their own shared nation state and live out the ramifications of doing so in real time. So this was a kind of play. This was an experimentation. And it was also a way of stepping again temporarily out of the conflict zone that was this present state between people who had a lot of differences with each other. And it wasn't about ignoring the fact that those differences existed. It was about saying, what else can also exist here? And then creating a space to work through and have collaborative discussion about what else that could be and creating trust to different degrees in the process. This is not to say that this solved all of Columbus Bean's issues, because it did not. But it was, again, a way of cultivating new degrees of trust, shared identity, and a certain sense of belonging. So speculative futures also invite us to not just think about the future, but to use our senses in order to feel it. And that can be a way of making the future feel like a really personal place. So this is a shot from a 2017 project called the Future Energy Lab, created by the studio Superflux for the government of the United Arab Emirates. Superflux created a series of interactive experiential futures installations with the goal of influencing the country's energy policies. So they identified five different energy scenarios that could occur in the country up to the year 2050. And they made an energy simulator, role-playing game, different interactive objects. So that different decision makers, the prime minister was involved, the head of cabinet, they could explore what these different energy futures would be, again, by feeling into and exploring in tactile ways what the ramifications could go down as. So in one scenario, people got to smell the air that might occur if current fossil fuel emissions rates continued. So it was a pretty noxious mix of carbon monoxide, nitrous oxide, it smelled like rotten eggs. And it was an experience that allowed people to not just think about air quality in the future, but to really feel it, to experience it. I'm borrowing a phrase from Stuart Candy, who's a Long Now Fellow and a former colleague of mine, that Speculative futures, this work, helps us to not just see into the future, but feel into the future. And when we do so, we can start to really relate to the future as a fundamentally personal place, which it really is. We will be living, some of us at least, 30 years from now. Our children, our grandchildren will be living there. The speculative futures can also be a powerful way of balancing between the parts of our brain that work with long-term vision and other parts that are more focused on the here and now. Because speculative futures tools really focus on different narrative aspects, they can be a way of, again, linking the specific and the personal to initiate the balance between these two time frames. So one example of what that can look like is a 2010 project called Europa. This used speculative design for an exploration of what Europe might look like in 2050. So the project depicted this future based on renewable energy production, where Europe's old boundaries are dissolved, replaced by new fictional states that are shaped by the type of renewable energy that each one is capable of generating. So these are new speculative states with names like Hydropia. That's where all the hydropower comes from. Solaria, that's where all the solar power is generated. And they're connected by a centralized energy grid. So this grid serves to redistribute renewable energy across the continent according to season. This is obviously fanciful, but it's also based on detailed research. They looked at greenhouse gas emissions, they looked at infrastructural conditions, and they found that the European Union at the time was the third largest producer of greenhouse gas, and they also pursued sustainable energy projects in really haphazard ways, like lots of solar farms in dark parts of Germany wind farms in parts of Italy where there's not a lot of wind. 
So Anaropa becomes a whole-scale redesign of the entire continent, reorienting renewable energy projects according to geographic location, reaching across the Mediterranean to also include parts of North Africa. And it's not a viable plan. It was never intended to be, reorganizing an entire continent by energy infrastructure and also by geopolitical borders. Like, it's out there, and that was the intention. Instead, an Europa becomes a framework to assess the technical and the economic feasibility of achieving really large-scale reductions. Designers here were intentionally trying to be provocative in order to spark wider conversations. And they did that successfully. This was covered by outlets like The Guardian. It was debated on parliamentary halls. <laughs> so the findings from its backtracking process, again, identifying a potential future that we could move towards and looking to see what steps we would take now in order to move in that trajectory was really the point. And it ended up, those identified steps, influencing certain aspects of policy recommendations. So instead of providing a concrete destination, Europa was a way of asking if we're going to achieve massive reductions in 40 years, what should we do now? Speculative futures tactics, I'm thinking world building here in particular, are also powerful in part because they help us find shared language. So this image is from a project that I worked on in 2020 called Future World Vision. And it was a project I worked on with the World Building Studio Experimental Design and the American Society of Civil Engineers. And we built an interactive educational virtual reality video game that explored what urban life could be in 2070. So we made it in collaboration with a range of stakeholders, experts in diverse fields. We were talking with people like material scientists, anthropologists, you know, technologists, community organizers, and we made it as a way so that we could start to find common ground across these different areas of expertise. And we did that in part by framing the city as a question, as a kind of provocation. Because this was made primarily for engineers, the questions that we asked were things like, what do transit systems become in 50 years? Again, trying to provoke a certain open space. We don't know the answers. We're very curious as to what the questions could be. And we use story spaces as ways to help people relate to what this could look like on a personal level. So a lot of our research, which you can see over on the right side of this image, translated into fictional science fiction stories about people's daily lives. And that was really just a dialogue. So when we went back for these workshops, we could say, hey, this is what we think might would happen. Like, what do you think? And again, really taking people's feedback from very different backgrounds, expertise orientation, seriously, and refining our designs, our proposals, our storylines accordingly, taking that into visual 3D form as well. And again, always across scales. Multifunctional transit corridors, for example, have to function at a city scale, but they also impact life at the ground scale. How do those scales impact each other? So as our city got more detailed, we could ask our collaborators deeper questions. So this process of iteration and communication over time was a way of creating a context where people from disparate backgrounds could start to speak an increasingly shared language. This video game space became a forum for collaboration, for dialogue, for different degrees of co-creation. So speculative futures can also be ways of pushing beyond participation and inclusion to more robust modes of co-creation. One example of what this can look like in practice comes from a project in LA. This one is called Sankofa City. It ran from 2014 to 2019 in the South LA neighborhood of Lemur Park, which is a site of a lot of heated discussions about cultural displacement and gentrification. So this was initiated by Lemur Park residents and students from USC's Department of Cinematic Arts. And Local residents wanted to see how they could use different kinds of creative collaboration and placemaking to strengthen the neighborhood's sense of identity and create stronger cultural connections that new arrivals could also understand and embrace. And the goal was really to spark public conversation about, again, the future trajectory of the neighborhood. And so they decided in this kind of what-if provocation-oriented way, let's kind of focus on something that a lot of people seem to be both curious about and also a little freaked out by, which is emerging technologies of augmented reality and autonomous transit. What happens when this neighborhood has augmented reality and autonomous transit on wide scale, widespread levels? So instead of using local feedback, you know, students from USC coming in to propose an idea and saying, hey, what do you guys think of this? They really use speculative futures tools to co-create this exploratory process from the beginning. And so had a lot of workshops. 
did a lot of design fiction, did a lot of speculative design. This was an iterative process where people came together over 15 times over the course of many, many months. And as the workshops progressed, participants started playing with the idea that their neighborhood wasn't just a future version of Lemur Park, but it was actually a different place entirely. It was called Sankofa City. And they decided Sankofa City had some primary values, community-based policing, it had education through gardening, It had complementary autonomous cars that were built and designed by local shops. So with each session, again, this refinement process started to go deeper, more detailed. And the visions generated in Sankofa City gave residents a more cohesive idea about how they wanted Lemur Park to transform and more agency in advocating for their preferences. And today, local residents are building on some of those visions by basically fundraising to enact some of them in real life. So one local leader, a man named Ben Caldwell, he's gotten some federal funding to start to prototype what some of these free autonomous shuttles could look like, and he's using them as opportunities to do skill building with local youth in the area, which is a big example of the power of creating narratives and visions that are rooted in place. When the story is being told, really belong to us when they are rooted in our communities and our neighborhoods. We're inherently more connected to what those stories show, and it's often the case that we can push generated ideas more effectively to the next level of impact. And it's why storytelling is a key part of cultivating sustained investment in the ideas of what our cities can be. It's why speculative futures can help us also enact city-making that go beyond mere inclusion. Like rather than acting as the experts in the room, professionals like me can start to use speculative futures to welcome residents as co-designers. Rather than feeling pushed aside, residents can start to use these tools to advocate for visions that really work for them and push designers like me to listen, to adapt, to co-create. Because the ways that we imagine the future fundamentally impact the products the infrastructure and the cities that we end up creating. The phenomenon of 20th century urban renewal that I touched on in the beginning of this talk was inspired in large part by a guy named Ebenezer Howard's designs for what he called the garden city. This garden city that influenced so much of 20th century developed in some pretty negative ways started out as somebody else's imagination. What we imagine, it's powerful. These days, our collective imagination skews pretty dystopian when it comes to thinking about the future. And we see that in the books we read, in the movies that are out there. And it's not to say that dystopian fantasy is bad. It can be a really powerful way of really questioning current issues and sounding the alarm. And yet when so much of it is so dystopian, it can be really hard on a wider level to think that alternatives are possible, right? Dystopia tells us, like, do less, despair more. When we don't push back against dystopian narratives, they can increasingly become real life. One of my favorite movies is Very Dark. Anybody else a Blade Runner fan? Right? It's a great movie. And it's also a really scary vision of what urban life can become. And it's become increasingly influential in urban space since it came out, now about almost 40 years ago. Sid Mead, the same visual designer who created the Blade Runner aesthetic, consulted on a lot of building projects in the Gulf region before he died in 2019. Blade Runner's influence also extends much farther around the world. The picture on the left here is from the original movie in 1982. The image on the right is Beijing in 2013. The question becomes, what kind of futures do we want to imagine for ourselves? Because those are the futures that we are most likely to create. So speculative futures are ways to push beyond dystopia and envision and enact the futures we want made real. The question then becomes, okay, how do we do this work? So there's no one way to do it, but a lot of projects that are pretty powerful often have engagement as a really core part of them. And the more iterative it is, the more it allows for a certain, again, shared language, shared values, trust to be built. And so this is not to say that this work is easy or quickly done, but definitely has a lot of potency and power when it's invested in in ways that are sincere. There are for sure opportunities to integrate these tools into different scales of our society. And I'm not here to tell you exactly what should be done, but I have some ideas. So when it comes to governmental levels, it could be a powerful thing to have different futures offices instituted within municipal, regional, 
or state systems that provide places for imaginative co-creation to happen on an ongoing basis. Because again, if you have this work that is tied directly to a project that is already decided on and it already has people working on it, it's going to have a way of basically including wider populations within a system that already has inertia. And it's not necessarily that way of provoking collaborative conversation. Because essentially that idea for what should be done is already like well-formed. So how can we have this visioning process be available be supported, be provoked on, again, an ongoing basis. Translating those visions can be then a really powerful way to inform other planning initiatives, policy recommendations, and infrastructural interventions. When we're talking about NGOs, research institutions, other aspects of you know, civic society, it can be a powerful role to be a mediator. Sometimes if you're talking about collaborations between community members who have been disenfranchised, different aspects of government, there can be very tense and mistrusting relationships, right? So having different people come in who don't necessarily have those same roles over different periods of time to act as mediators can be a really powerful role. Also, if you're a research institution, translating research in not just papers, but in different experiential ways can be a really powerful mechanism for helping more of us understand some of these changes that are accelerating and understanding, you know, more and more basically what's coming down the pike. Private sector, a lot of funding for futures literacy stuff can be done because a lot of it can be really well framed to particular groups. How is it different to talk about these issues for people who are under the age of 10 versus people who are over the age of 70, people who are from different socioeconomic backgrounds? And for individuals, is there an opening to make this work personal? What does it mean to think about what your life is going to be in 10 years? in 50 years? Are there similarities between where you think you might want to head and your family members? Are there people who are beyond maybe your family members and your wider community? If there are commonalities, where do modes for collaboration start to arise? Are there different organizations who are maybe working on some of these issues where you live that you can either donate to, maybe get involved with? Because using speculative futures alone is not going to solve the many problems that our cities face. They're not a silver bullet. They're not a panacea. Their power really lies on how their tools are harnessed and for what ends. But if we, all people who live in cities, can start to accept and engage with the fact that the futures we have, the futures that are evolving, they're constantly in flux, we can start to get closer to creating the more resilient cities and spaces that this century really demands of us. So these are tools that help us to not just recognize those inherently shifting contexts, but to actively imagine and co-create what they can be. The more we speculate about coming decades, the stronger we become. The stronger we become, the more cooperative, <laughs> the more resilient our urban spaces start to grow. And then speculative futures, again, they can be these ways of imagining and implementing the future in this present moment today, which is definitely, I argue, what we need a little more of. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. We're going to reset a little bit here. So thank you so much. You're so welcome. I wanted to get back to the, the part where this dystopian versus utopian part. And I always think it's interesting as you look back through science fiction, we seem to have waves of utopianism and dystopianism. And we seem to be, you know, as, as Blade Runner came out, kind of in a wave of dystopianism. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's good to have this kind of warning factor, but it also leaves you, as you said, building potentially the wrong futures. So yeah. I wonder if you could talk more about that. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the issues with this like dystopian, utopian divide is that it is binary. And in my opinion, like it's not about aiming for one or the other. It's about saying that there is a possibility of both incremental change and also just that utopia, even if it's something that we all agreed upon in this moment, would probably not stay that way in 10 years. And like it changes, right? And yeah, if we can aim towards something that people like Kevin Kelly call protopia, the fact that it's not about aiming for, you know, an ideal situation, but it's about acknowledging that even in an ideal situation, like complicated things are still going to be going on. And can we just like get into the nitty gritty of what that is as well? Can incremental positive change also be available to us? I think Kim Stanley Robinson likes calling it uptopia. It's like improvement as process. So yeah, I feel like utopia versus dystopia is emphasizing one or the other as destination. 
And it's not to say that, like, you know, aiming towards positive visions as, like, something that is a little bit more robust and concrete is bad, but I think acknowledging that those visions change. And I think that's why, again, this iterative process with different speculative futures tool set as an ongoing practice is a really powerful framing. And it's oftentimes not what people want to hear because it's nice to think that, like, if we just come up with that one idea, that's all we need to focus on. But it's usually not going to be that simple. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's Paul Sappho, uh, who's a, been a longtime futurist, who also said that you know no futurist ever got in trouble for predicting a negative future, um, but many <laughs> many get in trouble for predicting a positive future that might not turn out right. Yes. Um, and so I think there's 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 a safety in in going negative, um, which I think is is attractive, especially as you know various world events kind of uh, back it up. Um, I'm curious as you deal with city planners and civil engineers. I mean, in some ways, civil engineers, I mean, some of the greatest stories of long-term thinking we have are these big civil engineering projects that happen for water or, um, you know, in some cases, transportation. Um, and city planning, I mean, they've been working in decades and centuries for a long time. Um, they're probably very frustrated that the public isn't along with them. And I assume that these kind of things are great, even though maybe they're a difficult exercise for them to do. do they, are, they, are they welcoming to these exercises? Well, I'd say that these exercises are actually just part already of city planning architecture. Like, they're not new at all. I would say, though, that if you think of, like, the umbrella of speculative futures and the many different approaches that are in them, and then you turn it 90 degrees, it's a Venn diagram with a lot of other disciplines that also use these tools. And in the city planning architecture realm, oftentimes these, use, or these tools can be used for, again, prediction and persuasion. And so it's not that the tools themselves are going to save us. I think it's like how we use them can definitely improve things. So when they're focused a lot more on this provocative aspect, using humor, right? Challenging again, conventions, being a little bit more playful. That can be the way to harness them in order to facilitate more co-creative, collaborative envisioning and then action. Because yeah, I would say that in architecture and planning, for sure in my own professional experience, oftentimes it's about coming up with really sexy images. Because when you do that, everyone's like, well, that looks yeah, let's do that one. And it's not as if that's a bad thing. Like it can be so amazing to be inspired by something that looks great. But if you only put blue skies in your renderings in order to sell people an idea when you actually think through the impacts might not necessarily be that blue. Like there's not always going to be blue skies. It's going to rain sometimes. Can we yeah, just I bet be... that image of Beijing, they sold that building with the blue sky behind it. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> yeah. So let's like get into the nitty gritty when we work on these things and create openings and forums for us to do that with others. So this co-creative process that I think these tools can invite, because again, we're not all trained as planners and architects, but we all have imaginations. So how can that become the basis for how collaboration can start to deepen? And I thought a powerful point that you brought up is this idea that so much of how we design the future is people think it's the safest move is to use the lessons from the past, even though clearly our future has is changing much faster than it has in the past. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, as city planners are are doing this, it's it feels like the safe thing, but now it's is it becoming apparent that it's not more readily, or is or you know is it always going to be easier to sell a, a past idea? I mean, first I don't want to speak for all city planners because like you know there's a lot of us, and I do think that. Yeah, there's a lot more discussion of like, we're in serious trouble, we need to do stuff. And so for me, I think like what this book was about was how are tools that are already a part of the planning and design process, how can they be more widely used so that more of us can cultivate our own agency so that we can work with people like me, who have oftentimes in the past been the people like, I know best because like I went to school. So like, you should listen to me when it's really about more of us doing this work of thinking through what works for us, because yeah, nobody, no one person, no narrow group, no group of experts is going to have the answer. I can maybe know better, like what permitting process you need to go through or like what has worked for other cities when it comes to like the kind of street trees, like there's room for expertise for sure. But I think it needs to be implemented within a context where more of us are able to say like, actually hold up this is what I've thought through and let's talk about like us coming from all a place of power and agency and advocating for our preferences. 
Yeah, and I think that, that immersive part is key, right? Where you, it's, it's the way that you get community members into the design process, yes. and as opposed to just having something ha handed down from City Hall. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think at the end of the day, it's really about collaborative decision making. How can we do the often difficult and frustrating work of making decisions together? You know, it's not always easy to talk with other people who live in our cities, right? We have different, like, busy schedules for sure. We have different ways of doing things. We have different ideas, different socioeconomic backgrounds, a lot of just, like, differences. And so I think these can be tools to work with our differences and use the imaginative play space that can be a really, like, less charged sometimes, or at least, like, more inviting place to create some openings for some of those collaborative discussions to start to at least initiate, if not to deepen. And I know, you know a lot of the founders of Long Now were part of Global Business Network, whose main thing that they did was do scenario planning for uh, various agencies. And one of their biggest issues that was always kind of dicey is they would often create you know, extreme scenarios. And you know, like Black Mirror in a way is like an extreme scenario, that show, if, you, if you've seen it, uh, basically takes one idea of technology and pushes it so far that it's terrifying. Um, and so these kind of scenarios, when they get out as a civic project, freak people out, and sometimes in a good way. But I'm wondering, like, what's your take on doing extreme positive or negative scenarios, or is it better to kind of keep it in a more median zone? I like the ambiguous situations. I really love Ursula Le Guin's The Dispossessed, mostly for her subtitle, which is an ambiguous utopia. Because, like, again, no utopia, no dystopia is going to be entirely a place where, like, it's all, like, people, humans have a way of finding a way. Like, Blade Runner 2049. I really did love the scene towards the end, if people have seen this movie, where, like, everyone's coming together and they're like obviously going to foment like a you know community based revolution and i was like that's great that's probably like a great feeling that they're all having right there not that i want to live in a wasteland where everything is you know <laughs> orange and gray but i like challenging situations can sometimes really support amazing degrees of community coming together and that can be a beautiful aspect you know even amidst horrible devastation so Again, I'm not recommending or advocating or trying to say that going towards dark places is a good thing, but I think presenting them again as like one extreme or the other, I'm really interested in extreme scenarios that also, again, like Julian Bleeker is great about this and other people at the New Future Laboratory, design fiction folks, they're like, what's an extreme situation where you're still focusing on like, you know, the garbage disposal dude? Like, what's that like? So it's not just about like the hero's journey who's like the one who's doing all the crazy stuff. It's like, what does it mean when you have to go to the bathroom? Like, are you just digging a hole in the ground or is there actually somebody who like has thought about that? You know, just like, let's go to the basics of the mundane experience of being a person rather than, you know, thinking about some of these contentious like war games often. Like a lot of those really intense scenarios are really about strategic war game assessment and trying to figure out the roles of different government actors or really high-powered, wealthy individuals. And, you know, obviously those people are probably going to be thinking about this stuff in a really proactive way, and they have reason to do so. All the rest of us do as well. And I'm not, you know, a president of some country or, like, a billionaire. I'm a person who's going to be needing to figure out, like, how do I get a couple of noodles when I'm really hungry? Nice. Do we have audience questions? Glad you mentioned Kim Stanley Robinson in your comment there because my question is about him, uh, one of our favorites here. And his latest book is explicitly, uh, you know, imagining what the future would, would might be and how, how it happened. So assuming you've had the chance to read Ministry for the Future, um, you know, either, either what insights were surprising or fun for you or that you would relate to us as examples or, or how, how does that fiction work as a... As, as an example of your specu of yeah. speculative futures, and et cetera. No, great question. For those of you who haven't read Ministry of the Future, it is set in a future time frame where there literally is a ministry of the future who's responsible for, yeah, advocating for future populations. I think what I really appreciate most about that book, and there's a lot, he does amazing research. Kim talks with so many different scientists, 
governance experts, just like people who are really detailed in their field. And then again, he uses his science fiction to prototype in high resolution ways what these things can be when they come together. When you get people who are researching, how do you literally keep glaciers from melting given our warming world with people who are also really focused on different aspects of just like mundane city community building governance. What I really appreciate about that book is that he gets into the really annoying nitty gritty. Again, like it's not fun in that story to like be part of the ministry of the future. It's bureaucratic grind. And so I think he shows us in an understanding of the difficulties that really exist in making people, you know, care about people who don't exist yet or talk about the fact that all of our climate impacts are being felt so unequally. What's happening in Pakistan right now after these devastating floods is horrific and it's already people who are in a really difficult economic situation. So he, and I think in that story, isn't shying away from those issues and he's still, again, in this kind of uptopia uh, perspective, again, moving towards a positive trajectory in incremental fashion, still showing us like we have a lot of difficulties and how do you work with them? Another question in the back. Hi, uh, thank you for your amazing presentation. Um, you mentioned the resiliency of community in your presentation and I was wondering if you can give more examples of that more currently. Um, like what does it look like in different communities? Um, yeah, like just kind of more, because I'm just hearing a lot of like a um, physical space, but I'm just wondering if there's more development with physical space and the community aspect um, that you're seeing. Mm, like using speculative futures to do that. Yeah. So one of them, I talk about it in the book, um, that I think it's really remarkable is Agbog Bloshi. So it's a site in Ghana and it's an e-waste site mostly. Like it's really been used to dump a lot of our electronic waste for a long time. And people there are for sure like, you know, creating some environmental damage in the process of recycling a lot of this stuff. And they're also really amazing like prototypers and they have a really robust circular economy. So these two different architects got together. They had some ties to this community in different ways. And they kind of just started hanging out with people in the area because they wanted to like help, they wanted to improve, but they also didn't want to take this tack that a lot of designers and planners do, which is coming in from the outside and being like, we have a great idea, you should do this. So they just hung out and got to know people over time. They had to get grants to do it. It definitely like wasn't easy. And they learned over the course of just spending time there that it was also, a way of kind of like, they could get money in order to fund the work by basically reframing this environmental catastrophe, which is happening there, which is, you know, significant, by reframing it as an opportunity to augment the resilience of people in the area through basically supporting their economic prosperity. So they started to co-create with people using these speculative futures tools, a lot of aspects of prototyping, um, different ways of basically like coming up with economic systems to help them sell their goods. Because as really great prototypers, they were really good at making things that other people wanted. So how could they create a digital tool that, you know, help them reach a wider customer base so they can make more money? So, and through that digital tool also make available more information about environmental protections that they could take, but doing it in a way that was tied to the thing that people were much more motivated by, which was becoming economically stable, and in doing so, forming stronger ties with each other, greater senses of autonomy and agency. So the resilience aspect, you know, it's a buzzword. Is it the most like useful word for what we're talking about? Not always, but I think what becomes pretty powerful about it to me, it's the reason why I chose it for this book, is that it operates on different scales. Again, like that particular project in Agbak Boshi was about like family individual resilience. And then it also became about stronger community agency and resilience at this other scale. So one example. Nice. Thank you so much. Thank you.